Okay, we're back on. So one of the things that you talked about was Redondo as a wide open city. Yeah, oh yeah. And we've heard a number of things about the gamblers and some mm -hmm. gangsters that may even have been oh, yes. in Redondo Beach in downtown Redondo. And we've also heard about Fifi Maloof and her, what some people say are a house of ill repute. Yes. And others say that she was a lady that very much help charities and help people in Redondo Beach. So what can you tell us? I know you said that you did not know her, but you knew of her and people who knew her. So what can you tell us about her and the wide open characteristics of Redondo Beach in the 40s? There was, uh, she, was uh, she was a madam. And uh, uh, during uh, the, th the 30s, and uh, she had a place right on the uh, ocean front down there. And uh, and uh, they had a little small, like a little small restaurant in the corner of it. Uh, little, and uh, but uh, the the word was that there was activities that uh, young boys didn't know about. Uh, and uh, till later on, uh, she uh, was uh, uh, well known throughout uh, Redondo uh, as far as the fact that she was there and uh, had a an ongoing business there. And um, she. Um, I uh, knew uh, Pierce Venable, who was part of the Venable family. Um, he used to take care of her big limousine that he, she had a chauffeur, and uh, uh, and he used to. Uh, so he knew her pretty well, and uh, she was uh, a kind person. Uh, as far as she, uh, it was said that she um, uh, donated a whole lot of money to pretty much buy a, 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 a military airplane or the funds to build an, uh, a, a regular production line plane. She, 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 was, uh, she had probably enough business um, uh, during, uh, during World War II so she could afford to do quite a bit. She, uh, there's a lot of sailors and soldiers and everything else around and, uh, and uh, they were here away from home and uh, and so there was there was quite a bit of activity. Now, when you talk about the military airplane, what was that related to? Well, she uh, they she wanted to I guess help the war effort, and uh, the the word was that she uh, she donated en enough funds to the government that would have built an airplane. To build one airplane? No, or to no. Build? This is just the cost of one on the production line. Wow. Oh. This was not a plane. This like. A B-17 coming off the line, uh, would uh, she would have uh, uh, given the funds to the government for the, what the cost of that plane would be to actually manufacture it. Now you said Pierce Venable. Venable, yeah. And he took care of her limousine. Mm -hmm. And do the, you ever remember seeing her in Redondo Beach with her limousine or? No, oh, I, I think I saw I saw her car once going down the street, but uh, uh, as we we didn't. I didn't come down and hang around uh, Redondo as a growing kid. Uh, we had enough activity and everything down our, our end of, of Redondo. Um, but uh, uh, it, everyone knew who and what was going on there, it seemed, uh, within certain age circles. Now, when we talked to uh, Barry Hamilton, he said that when he joined the Navy and went down to the Naval Induction Center, they asked them where they were from, and he said Redondo Beach, and the chief petty officer that was inducting him said, oh, where Fifi Maloof is. <laughs> yeah, so now, that's it. She, was, she had a, 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 a good uh, reputation with an unusual business. <laughs> so uh, now you were in the Merchant Marine. Did anyone ever mention to you when you were in said you were from Redondo Beach or Hollywood Riviera that, oh, yeah, that's... No, I, I, uh, my uh, time was spent uh, uh, in and out of uh, the local uh, San Pedro uh, when I was running coastwise. I was on tankers most of the time, but most of the time I was overseas uh, uh, going to uh, New Zealand and Australia and the Hebrides and... Uh, and uh, different uh, uh, islands, Guadalcanal, and places like that. Uh, so, um, covering the Pacific, and and of course, I went through the uh, Merchant Marine Academy in New York, and uh, and uh, went to sea as an officer. 
Now, during, during the war, did you run convoys uh, with the Merchant Marine in the Pacific? Uh, uh, right at the first of the war, we were over there. I was over there in uh, 42 and uh, May 42, uh, uh, just after the Coral Sea. And I was on a uh, Liberty ship, and we were hauling equipment out of uh, Australia up to Port Moresby and uh, uh, hauling uh, uh, equipment up there to build the airfield and, uh, and uh, the roads and things. And uh, at that time, the only, all we had was the uh, uh, Port Moresby there. And uh, uh, we were very fortunate that uh, one other ship that was going in and out, it got bombed and uh, was sitting over in the mud burning when we were, came in our next trip. But uh, uh, then we also didn't get bombed once in a place called Thursday Island. That they bombed the field across from us, and we were right in Darwin, Australia, after a big uh, bunch of ships got, our ships were there got uh, uh, bombed and sunk. So I was. You're fortunate not to be attacked. Uh, you don't want to be attacked. But I saw a lot of craters in places where we were, where they'd been bombed, and and uh, so it was. Uh, you you knew you were in a war. Now, one of the things we've heard uh, is that there was a high percentage of Japanese students in Redondo Beach when you were going through high school, mm -hmm. and that oh, many yeah. of their families owned farms and oh, yeah. and uh, farms and ranches that were around the east. coast. Um, did you know about any of your classmates that may have been interned or that? Anything about them after the war or during the war? Did you I keep did, contact I, with them? I, uh, you mean the Japanese? Yes, your oh, Japanese yeah, classmates. Yeah, yeah, um, quite a few. Um, you see, um, Malagokov School from the lighthouse, the uh, Point Vincente Lighthouse, this way, uh, the kids uh, that were farming around the coast there, uh, the Enos and the uh, uh, all the different families that were farming out there, uh, they came to uh, to Malaguco School, and then they also uh, came to Redondo High School, and uh, the Mikis and uh, uh, and uh, Ishibashi and all the rest of the families up there, and uh, so a lot of them got interned. Um, well, one of the uh, uh, Aki Ishibashi I knew later on. Uh, he he and his brother Kay uh, had. Uh, raised strawberries over on Sepulveda next to our plant. Uh, Kei Ishibashi was one of those that was in the, the Japanese uh, uh, group, the, the Hawaiian. Um, uh, he was part of that group that was in Italy and, and, uh, and, uh, and went up and got the Germans off the top of a mountain and then they also went into France, uh, into France and uh, rescued uh, uh, a group of uh, 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 soldiers that got trapped by the by the Germans, and so they were the Gopher broke. The four forty second, I think. Mm -hmm. And K. Ishibashi was. Does he, Ishibashi do you was, know if he still he, lives in the area? Oh, no, he he uh, he was, did live in this area, and then he bought a, um, a, 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 a an avocado uh, ranch up there at uh, Carpinteria, and he has since has died. Um, Aki Ishibashi is still alive. Jim Ishibashi's gone, Moss I'm not sure of, and but I and you know I knew knew all those a lot of those people and and uh, and uh, I've not seen too many. I've seen uh, uh, some of the Mikis and uh, some of the others, but uh, they all drifted um, to different areas. Well, what seems amazing is that you did know so many families in in Redondo Beach in the South Bay, and that doesn't seem like today that's it's much different. What other families lived in the South Bay that had played a significant role in maybe not building the whole South Bay, but specific sites or areas and things that are of interest today? Well, there was um, um, uh, quite a few uh, people that uh, had businesses locally and uh, uh, that uh, were uh, involved. And, and of course, uh, my folks knew them because my dad was a Rotarian with, in Redondo Rotary, and so he knew uh, many of the, uh, you might say, the local uh, uh, pushers and uh, and um, uh, people that were, made things happen. The Zuligers, the uh, 
uh, McFadden, a, um, and I could sit and maybe think of a whole bunch of others. Uh, the Williams, uh, Hilker Williams, who was the manager of the bank and was one of the vice presidents of uh, B of A. And uh, in fact, the Williams family is still here with the uh, uh, the uh, third gener uh, second generation um, optometrist in the Riviera Village, and uh, so they've uh, have. Uh, uh, an old family, and of course the days, and uh, knew the days quite well, and uh, uh, Foster and, and Betty Day, and uh, so uh, uh, there are a lot of a lot of the local families like that that were uh, uh, are still around. And what do you remember about the power plant in Redondo Beach? Well, as when I was growing up, there was no power plant there. There was a, a shell of the Huntington uh, power plant that was originally there and the pier and uh, that he had uh, for uh, 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 bringing in the cool uh, ocean water for his uh, 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 power plant. And all through the 30s, it was just a, uh, a bunch of concrete uh, uh, structures sitting there, uh, abandoned, and at that time we had the lake was behind it, the Salt Lake, and uh, uh, that's that has quite a history. I don't know if anybody's talked about it or not, but the fact that the Indians used to collect salt there, and um, and of course, uh, I've done some studies on the, the ones that lived there in the Hollywood Riviera, up on the bluffs. But the Indians, uh, people inland, didn't have salt. And so it was a, a very uh, important source of trade with uh, the Indians inland that would have uh, acorns and uh, different foodstuffs and, they, and, the, and, uh, the, and a certain amount of rushes and things that wouldn't be along the coast. So, and also the, the uh, Indians here had uh, access to shell uh, uh, for decorative purposes. Now, did you ever play at the lake? They said they called no, it the I, pond. And... Yeah, it was it was a pond. I never had reason to, but uh, yeah, it 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 was a uh, it was a viable a viable salt lake, and uh, and um, it uh, it's a shame that when they decided they're going to build a harbor, that they didn't incorporate that in to the harbor, but they they filled it in, and then of course all it is is a bunch of tankage now for the for the refi for the uh, Edison plant their AES so uh, uh, it was uh, as as the need occurred as far as the expansion after the war and all the houses and the apartments and everything that more need for more power then uh, there was a reason to build the existing plant the first segment and what year did you return from the merchant marine that you I started living here again uh, 1945. I uh, got out just just before the end of the war, and um, and uh, uh, then uh, I, in 1946 we uh, we started a business and uh, and uh, so was uh, around here all that time and and uh, growing up, getting married, and doing all sorts of things. Well, you talked about the plant. What was the plant? Did you have a manufacturing plant? Yeah, we uh, 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 were we manufactured a projection screen. It's still in existence over there on Sepulveda, and it's east of Normandy. And uh, uh, we started out uh, in a little makeshift building that was up on 190th, and uh, what had, uh, the, the elites of family Golden State Fireworks had put those buildings there for uh, uh, a manufacture of uh, of uh, cartridges, 20 millimeter, and then of course that we uh, the buildings were in limbo, so we went in there and started our business there and uh, till they kicked us out and uh, they moved over on Sepulveda, but uh, we manufactured projection screens for the studios and for theaters, uh, for audiovisual, for the military, and uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, won two Academy uh, rec uh, certificates, which is the same as uh, a an Oscar for a supplier to the industry, and uh, we were supplying all the local studios, and and uh, it's still ongoing business. 
So you, you talked the one family name that you've talked about, and we've heard about the explosion of the fireworks factory. It's the Leeksa. Elitza. Elitza. Yeah, yeah, they lived up on Palos Verdes, up near Levanta, and uh, uh, Pat Leitza and uh, was the father, and they were uh, related to the uh, to uh, back in St. Louis. Uh, part of his relatives were in the fireworks business back there. The Pat Leitza had Golden State Fireworks, and uh, and he had the the plant here, and then he had a plant in Saugus. Um, and uh, up there and uh, Santa Clarita Valley, they call it now. And uh, he, uh, 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 just before, this was before he built that plant there the, to the size it was, but they somehow somebody who did something wrong and uh, ever so often or throughout the world, uh, China and other places, you'll hear of a fireworks plant going, <laughs> coming un, unstuck. And, and so they... Uh, uh, yeah, he was a very nice man, and he had a, a son and a daughter. And later on, Hugo Leitza did operate the plant. And uh, uh, in fact, of all things, we, we went uh, when uh, later on after I retired from the screen business, I was in special effects, and we went over to the the plant that the which was uh, not in use over there in, uh, in the valley over there in Saugus and shot. Uh, part of a motion picture with explosions and everything for <laughs> for uh, a part of a film. So um, the Elisa family owned this. Do you remember that explosion when it blew up in Redondo Beach? I uh, I know I know people that felt it, and uh, but I I knew I knew the Elisa family, but uh, I didn't uh, I didn't uh, uh, talk to them ever about the, about the explosion, but uh, I knew. Uh, uh, Hugo and Gloria and uh, and, the, and the family and and Gloria's husband uh, when she got married by uh, that was an unfortunate thing it, but uh, uh, they were out there in the middle of nowhere really there was uh, it didn't really it it shook people up about uh, where would that fireworks plant have been if we were looking at today's streets in Redondo Beach uh, it'd be um, a, a, Fairly close to the hardware store that's on 190th, on the north side uh, of uh, 190th there. Before you get to uh, Inglewood Avenue, so that's actually in fact, Marianne. They own, they own from Inglewood Avenue uh, west uh, for uh, to to about where that uh, hardware store is. That's Ace. That's not Ace. What is that hardware store now? The hardware store is at Marianne, is the street that runs between it. That's the alleyway where all yeah. the body shops are. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's Marianne uh, and Phelan. Yeah. Are the, Phelan is just uh, just east of, of that, but it'd be Marianne, and do they own it all the way back to Entradero or Meyer Lane? They, yeah, they owned uh, quite a bit to the north uh, uh, and um, probably fairly close to where the uh, playground, uh, the school playground is there. They. They had a pretty good piece of property. That would there. be at Ringe and yeah. uh, at Ringe was, and Ripley. Yeah, it was a it was a big square piece of property. One reason I'm asking is you said you first opened your screen business in Redondo Beach at uh, at some buildings that yeah, the, were there. And yeah. where would that be? Well, it was uh, one of those that was in there inside the, on that o- open property. Then there was just a bunch of wooden buildings in there, and uh, and uh, so we went into one of those, and uh, then we were weren't really. Uh, supposed to be there, but uh, it got us started. So you, you would probably have had one of those industrial buildings that is behind, on Marianne on the street that runs back. What uh, what made you start building film screens in Redondo Beach? How did it come about that you chose that industry well, and here? When my uh, uh, dad uh, sold out the Riviera Beach Club, uh, one of the uh, men that used to come down there had a plastic business in West Los Angeles and uh, uh, and so uh, he went to work over there, and uh, one of the departments uh, was had been before the war had been uh, they started out to be make projection screens, and uh, during the war you couldn't get the materials, so just after the war why they sort of started back into it, but they'd gotten so heavy into injection compression molding that uh, this was sort of in limbo. So 
we bought the business out and uh, brought it down to Redondo. Now, one thing you're, you said, your dad sold out his interest in the Riviera Beach Club. What did he own? I, you said he was the manager it, from 30 to 42, but did he own a portion of it? He didn't own a portion of the club, no. The club was always owned, and in fact, uh, due to the uh, economic conditions, the um, he all it was paid on was paid on the on the, the mortgage on the interest was ever that was all that was ever paid for all through those years the the principal was uh, not paid and so the uh, the Huntington people actually owned uh, all through that uh, had uh, subsidized the building of it and uh, and owned it so then uh, when he sold out he sold equipment that uh, uh, you might say kitchen and, and other accoutrements that were part of the uh, of the uh, in the building. Now, what would have been the difference between a screen that your father and you built and what was hanging in the Fox Theater in 1930, 1937 or nineteen forty one when you went to to they, go to the theater? The uh, ones that used to be were a, a, a form of painted muslin and. Uh, 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 some of them uh, were uh, perforated for sound, and uh, most of them were. And uh, they run through machines, and then they were seamed together. And if you went up close, you could see the vertical seams just like you can see here. Uh, but we made seamless sheets as large as 46 by 88 feet of clear plastic, no seams, no joints. Now, did you ever find yourself replacing the screens at the, either the Fox or the Strand or one of the theaters locally? No, uh, we, uh, we uh, put screens into uh, Man's Chinese, uh, Westwood, and, uh, and uh, uh, screens for uh, special theaters and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, also in all the studios used screens because they didn't have seams in them because when they're sitting in their viewing rooms looking at product, they... Uh, they, they don't want to have anything there that uh, they say, is that on the film or is that in the screen? They, they, they're they looking for quality. So uh, we, we did that. We made a lot of screens for the military. They put them in the ships. One interesting thing happened. They took and uh, uh, we made a, a special screen and they took it down to San Diego and they chopped a hole in the side of a submarine and uh, to get the screen in aboard for, for plotting and then they welded it shut. <laughs> and do they say why they did that? Well, it's because they needed that aboard, and they they needed it so. Uh, so we built the screen and the, and the aluminum frame for it, and they and they couldn't get it any other way. Once you close up a submarine, you don't have any big hatches. This, now the business you say the business I think today is next to a Mulligans or near yeah just near, east of it there just east of Expo, Mulligans. Yeah. And are they still? Creating uh, I guess so. I, I have nothing to do with them anymore. That's uh, I uh, retired after 40 years in uh, '85, and uh, I went into special effects after that for about seven years, and uh, and uh, then uh, retired from that. So, what can you tell us about? Uh, I think one of the things that you mentioned in a pre-interview was the relationship between Hollywood and the people who work in Hollywood and Redondo Beach and Hollywood Riviera. Well, it was the, uh, of course, back in the 30s uh, and the, the late 20s and the 30s, why uh, the, the ro uh, Hollywood was a romantic place, and um, and uh, uh, they uh, had not uh, gone out to uh, a uh, valley as much. Then valley was pretty much uh, sagebrush for most of it. In fact, uh, of all things, Clifford Reed uh, uh, named North Hollywood North Hollywood when he first started selling lots there. He gave it that name. In fact, he, he also named Westwood uh, 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 Wood that because uh, uh, when Fritz Burns and uh, Fred Marlowe were developing uh, uh, Westwood why, uh, area, why, uh, they, they needed a name, so he, he suggested it. So that's uh, uh, so anyway. The idea was that you had a nice setting down here, and at the time there was a vision of the, a major highway uh, access from the South Bay into Los Angeles at, on a uh, uh, that would be uh, part of the development down here, 
and uh, it would have been a great thing to have a, an early freeway. And uh, so, but that didn't happen because of uh, the changes and the, and the tracks that were developed. But uh, there was some uh, people that uh, probably uh, Rosemary DeCamp uh, uh, lived in the Holly Rivera for many years and uh, I watched her raise her children and little girls and, uh, and, uh, and she and uh, Judge Scheidler, uh, John Scheidler uh, lived there for a long time in the, on the Holly Rivera. So they were one one big um, uh, uh, movie star that was there officially. Now, it, a lot of people in 2005 wouldn't know who Rosemary DeCamp is. What movies oh. do you remember most about her? Well, if you there can? was a, a, a uh, what was the one about Bob? Uh, I was on t television forever and ever. Love that Bob. Love that Bob. Yeah, that was uh, that was one of her uh, uh, ongoing things after she was not as active. Uh, as she was maturing, as far as being a uh, the, the the main actress, she was a supportive role. Nice lady. Now you had said something in the pre-interview about Louis B. Mayer. Yeah, uh, it was um, uh, they right after the war. Uh, they they three men. Uh, one was Rudy Mayer, which is Louis B. Mayer's brother, and a man named Kenner. And another uh, a gentleman uh, gained access to the upper level part of of Hollywood Riviera up in the flat up there, and uh, uh, they uh, uh, developed those houses up there. So, but I imagine Louis Mayer's money was probably one of the uh, reasons that they were had the money to do that, and they built those small, fairly small places up there, and uh, there was such high demand that of course they sold out very quickly. Now, a lot of people, uh, you said that your first house uh, on Via Linda Vista, how much did that cost? A little over 8000 just the actual house cost. And the land? The land, uh, I don't know what the land price was. There were lots that were selling around 3000 uh, in that area that, during the early sales. And then today, what do you think that one of those properties in 2005 <laughs> costs? <laughs> well, uh, uh, uh I don't know uh, the my house is uh, in the neighborhood of over a million today's uh, market there uh, others on the street have sold for that and a little bit more and uh, which is astounding it just it's hard to even even think about it you know that something could be such a I built the house uh, Betty and I built the house for uh, the actual cost of the house was uh, twenty-one, a little over twenty-one thousand, and then we put an addition on that was another sixteen thousand, so roughly forty thousand dollars. And and this this piece of silly piece of property is worth <laughs> worth over a million dollars today. So one of the things that uh, I think is known about Hollywood Rivera is it has a lot of Spanish influence, uh, Spanish style homes. Do you know how that came about? Yeah, because the, uh, the original uh, restrictions were that all houses had to be tile roof houses, uh, uh, Spanish motif. So that was the reason. And then that was in effect till after the war when uh, they, uh, the rapid expansion and growth, uh, they did not follow the, um, the, uh, the uh, early restrictions. In fact, Palos Verdes was uh, was in the same uh, category. They, they have held the uh, tile roofs uh, as much as possible on the visible area that you can see from from down below. And so, one of the things we wanted to talk about were some of the jobs that you had. You talked about lifeguarding at the Hollywood Riviera yeah, Club. Yeah, I did a little bit of that and uh, worked as. Uh, uh, and we used to have to move the furniture around when they changed from a lounge to a to a uh, dance floor for a large party and uh, uh, and uh, sometimes I'd be on the desk if, if there need be you know just fill in jobs and uh, uh, after a big party why there was always a lot of cleanup to uh, that had to take place. 
probably the wildest party that ever occurred there was uh, one time North American Aircraft and uh, had uh, all their employees invited down to a party there. And and uh, this this is a wild one. And they had free beer and uh, f and later on food. And uh, and the, the people came and, and their friends came and the cars were parked all over the area. And uh, I don't know how many people were there. And uh, it was it was a it was a wild a wild party, and uh, and of course the next day why we went down there and had to clean up this 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 mess, and of course there was, the whole place smelled of beer. <laughs> People were carrying beer and anything they could put a beer into. <laughs> They'd take flower pots and dump them out and, and put, hold it and pour, pour some beer into it and drink it. <laughs> You talked about uh, some of the lifeguards at the at the club. You said there was a the most famous of your lifeguards had another something that he was famous for. Uh, Tom Blake, uh, who was probably uh, one of the er early original uh, surfers on the coast here, and uh, he and uh, Doc Ball, who was a dentist in Hermosa, and uh, some of the old gang uh, were the uh, more or less the original people that surfed here in the South Bay and, and uh, South. Uh, and Tom Blake was, uh, uh, he was quite an originator and, uh, and he worked as a lifeguard two years at the club and then he was a lifeguard at uh, Palos Verdes Swimming Club for a, a year. And uh, uh, in fact, I uh, learned to surf using his own private, his own boards as a kid. and. Uh, very, very nice man, and uh, uh, so uh, got to know him quite well. You yeah. said that he was responsible for making one of the first he, hollow he, boards. He had he he got a patent on on the um, uh, hollow surfboard built up out of uh, wood and rather than a solid plank like redwood or koa or uh, different or different woods, and uh, so he he had that and he he. Uh, it was uh, licensed uh, some uh, co companies in Los Angeles that actually manufactured the boards that the lifeguards were using, uh, hollow boards, for rescue purposes. And uh, uh, he was, uh, uh, he also developed the original uh, aluminum uh, 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 safe uh, can they, uh, for the lifeguard rescue cans. And uh, he uh, sold quite a number of those. Now, do you remember what, where did Tom Blake live in Redondo Beach? He lived there at the club. He had a room there at the club. And, and what years was that where he was, was uh, a lifeguard at the club? That was like uh, 38, 39. And uh, then he was a uh, lifeguard up in uh, Palos Verdes in about 1940. And uh, yeah, so he, was, uh, he was a real... Uh, Real waterman, and uh, and you think that he he developed the cans for the lifeguards? The, yeah, uh, went from the old uh, uh, steel cans to uh, aluminum um, uh, uh, safety cans, and uh, then of course now they've developed some other uh, types of uh, uh, flexible uh, safety equipment. Now, do you think he was ever involved in the Los Angeles County lifeguards afterward? He he never was. Uh, I don't think he ever worked as a uh, uh, a beach guard per se, um, a, except there at the club, and uh, and then uh, he he was uh, he he never he, he wasn't a there was no beach guards in those days that were uh, uh, there uh, there was some guards there at Hermosa, and uh, there was some guards. Uh, uh, Redondo had some uh, pool guards there in the, in the swimming uh, the beach club. I mean, the, uh, the uh, big plunge, and uh, but uh, there was no. Uh, uh, and of course, Santa Monica had guards uh, on their beaches, but uh, and Venice, but down this way there was no uh, 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 lifeguard, no lifeguard stands. There was no nothing that uh, uh, for emergency. If something happened, the Redondo, uh, the the 
guard uh, truck would have to come from Hermosa or someplace to uh, uh, effect a, uh, uh, help to uh, somebody. Uh, comparatively, between, say, the 30s and 40s, where the club was at its height, and today, were the beaches more crowded or less crowded? Oh, uh, they're more crowded now. Uh, you see, back then, there was no... You, you just went down and parked your, your car uh, on the bluffs and, and went to the beach. And, uh, uh, and uh, now, of course, you've got parking lots, and, and uh, so there's... There, uh, you, there's more population, so there's bound to be more cars, more people, and but back then, why uh, there'd be wide open spaces along the beaches. There was quite a, a group of people that would uh, uh, congregate uh, uh, south of the club, and they'd park on the on the bluffs there, and uh, camp, and uh, and uh, spend uh, spend time on the beach and. And uh, so that was uh, that was a, uh, a quite a popular spot for people just to come and, and go to the beach, but there was no lifeguard. There's nothing. You're on your own as far as if there was a problem. Now, were you aware of any fatalities that happened through the years near the club? Or uh, uh, at one time, there was a um, uh, 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 somebody got in a riptide there in front, just almost in front of the club, and uh, uh, I was fairly young then. And uh, somebody went out to help them, and and they were trying to hold them up and didn't know quite what they're doing. But eventually they got them both in. But uh, uh, people were not uh, aware of uh, the ocean and riptides. Uh, the edu level of education was not there. And what year did you start surfing? I was uh, uh, about uh, 19... Uh, 37 or 38 line there. And where did you surf? I surfed there at the, at the beach and then I later on I used to surf up the cove, Palos Verdes. And uh, in later years I'd surfed uh, Malibu and San Onofre and San Diego and, and different places. Well, what years would that be when you say later years? Oh, up, up until uh, uh, about 49 uh, and then uh, by that time I Occupationally, why uh, taking too much of my time? I got married and started raising a family, and uh, and then uh, and when you start a business and you work a business, you don't just go off whenever you feel like it. You you, you hit the grindstone. Now, was there a culture of surfing though, even in the 30s and oh, 40s yeah. here in Redondo Beach? Uh, there was a group of us used to be uh, uh, up the cove um, every every morning as long as there's some surf year round. And what were the names of the people that might have been well, on the surfboard? There's still a gentleman that uh, uh, is, is surfing up there, last I knew, Fenton Scholes. And he's older than I am, and he still goes down to the cove there and surfs. Uh, hey, Calvin Clark, he, uh, Tully Clark, uh, uh, some of the guys back then were uh, 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 Dick Miney. You probably know the if you're involved in the uh, yacht club, Dick Miney. And the daughter is involved in the King uh, King Harbor Yacht Club, and uh, now it, I don't think the water would have been any warmer then than it is now. Did you <laughs> did you have? I, I don't think wetsuits were even in. There was no such thing as a wetsuit. How did you did, did you have any method of staying warm, or you just went and you were cold? You, you finally you get so cold that your fingers wouldn't close. You're trying to paddle like this. You couldn't move your fingers. Well, you thought, it's about time to to get out of this water. <laughs> I remember one time I, uh, the waves were uh, spasmodic and we were sitting out there, it was winter, and uh, I, I was getting so darn cold, uh, trying to get a wave to go in. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't paddle in, you've got to have to take a wave. And so finally a wave came and I caught it and I started to get up and I fell forward, my face was on the board, my arms were dragging the water, and I was riding the wave, and I couldn't move. <laughs> hey, you told us about your involvement in the Merchant Marine. Do you remember when the ship ran aground on Palos Verdes? Did you have, do you have any oh, recollection of that? Oh, that was long that? after that, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Greek uh, uh, freighter ran aground, yeah. yeah. No, that, was, that was long after, that was uh, in the, 
I can't remember just when, a, a good good friend of mine that I uh, uh, sail with and surf with and everything, uh, he is a dentist, and he, in fact, that morning, he was on his way up to when Palos Verdes High School was uh, operating back then, and he was on his way up there as a dentist and a voluntary just to check the kids' teeth. And uh, he was he, he got there in all this excitement, so he was right there when it happened. So he could tell you exactly the day. Um, is there anything else that you can remember about Redondo Beach that today people wouldn't have any idea that that's what this this city was about? Uh, anything that's changed? I mean, they used to have. Uh, we've seen pictures of uh, Western days and pictures of. Oh yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the community affairs that happen in Redondo Beach on a regular basis? They, uh, it was, uh, there wasn't enough people to do big events, you know. It was, uh, they used to have that Western uh, event down there on the front. But uh, uh, there was, there was not a lot of, uh, uh, you might say, heavy community uh, organization as you get nowadays to, uh, 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 both like in Hermosa and here and 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 Manhattan, uh, the volleyball and the and the uh, uh, music concerts and all this other activity that uh, was was not needed back then. And, uh, things were, uh, of course, through the 30s. Why well, things were pretty tough uh, economically. There wasn't the uh, the financial cushion that people have had for the, these later years to go and do things. Now, do you remember Western days of what that was like? Did they actually have horses or mules or? Yeah, they had sort of a parade. I think I was down there for part of one, one time, uh, but I, I didn't, uh, we, we didn't uh, uh, rush down there uh, to uh, those things. Uh, 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 they, uh, we, I guess our, our parents were fairly strict with us growing and they, we, we didn't just were cut loose and say, "Come back, see if you can get back for dinner." You know, it was uh, it was pretty much a, a little bit more structured than the kids are involved today. And one of the things we talked to a, a person who said, from the very first time that he came to Redondo Beach till today, it's taken the same amount of time to get to Los Angeles. Whether it was on the red car, in a car, it's always about forty-five minutes to an hour. Just about, yeah. It's uh, it runs about the same because it used to be you didn't drive as fast and uh, you didn't have the arterials that you have today to get back and forth. You to go from here uh, when we first moved down here, there was the what they call the uh, uh, the uh, uh, a, what's Aviation Boulevard uh, was the uh, Redondo Trail, and uh, you came west uh, uh, from the, uh, the center of Los Angeles, which in then wasn't very big, uh, and you came down uh, Figueroa, uh, or you came down and came west and came along past Minesfield, which is now LAX, and uh, uh, to get down to, to Redondo. And uh, in fact, Western uh, stopped at Torrance. Western was not through. Uh, uh, just south, just right there, just past Carson. It was uh, just a dirt, dirt road, and uh, till later on, it it went on through down and through Lamita. So, if you drove to Los Angeles in the late '30s, early '40s, um, it, uh, they said there was one o one. They called it one o one, which would be Pacific Coast Highway, or Camino Real. Would well, you could you take that north, or would you have to go east um, near Imperial, which is where Mines Field was, I think. It, would Minesfield be about where Imperial Highway is today? Oh yeah, well, that's uh, Imperial and uh, Aviation, and uh, and uh, Pacific Coast Highway is the, w the westerly uh, edge of it. Well, uh, a, there was not a uh, there was not a lot of ways to get places uh, as there is today, and of course the vehicles that you drove, you went. Uh, uh, 35, 40 miles an hour, and uh, you're going along pretty good, and uh, uh, you and you didn't have a lot of stop signs as you do today, and uh, start and stop, and on the surface streets, so it's uh, it was it's uh, so much different now, uh, just due to mass 
of uh, people and uh, structures and everything else. It's well, you called aviation the Redondo Trail. How did it get that name? Well, because it came down to Redondo, and, and uh, you see, Hermosa wasn't, and uh, Manhattan were were not. Uh, Redondo was uh, a more of a major city back then, with its uh, had some industry. Uh, so Redondo was sort of the uh, terminus or the, uh, the end of end of the road, and uh, so uh, you came down it. Uh, uh, you could come down. Uh, What's the street that's east of Hawthorne Boulevard? Uh, Prairie? Uh, Prairie, yeah. Once in a while we'd come down Prairie, and Prairie did come through. And then we'd come to uh, 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 what is uh, uh, North Redondo, and then have to come down whatever street was available there. Now aviation today come, uh, comes south, and then it intersects and dead ends <clears throat> into Pacific Coast Highway. Was there a different path to aviation where it came all the way to Redondo Beach uh, mm -hmm. prior to to its well, current? There wasn't any aviation. Uh, didn't have that name, and I don't know what it probably was uh, it, back in those days. It, uh, uh, I do remember coming on Prairie and, and coming down Figueroa, uh, or coming down what they call Redondo Trail through all the eucalyptus trees. And, uh, Where were the eucalyptus trees all, on the Redondo all along, Trail? All along uh, a aviation and along the, what was Imperial had uh, uh, way back when just big eucalyptus trees all on there. And uh, that was, uh, you, you always knew what street you're on because of these big trees. So in Redondo Beach, besides uh, you did surfing, um, do you, did you ever have any hobbies with cars or anything like that, or do you remember oh, yeah. your first car? Yeah. Oh yeah, I I built up uh, built up several cars and did a lot of work on other people's cars, built them for them, and uh, and built surf some surfboards for myself, and uh, and uh, you know, always had projects and still do, but uh, I have not built up, not built up a, a complete motorcycle here in recent years and uh, and restored it. Yeah. So, what was the first car that you built? I had a uh, 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 AV8, and it was stolen. And uh, then I took and uh, I got the uh, got the uh, components back, and then I changed it and made it into a a, a bucket, and uh, and so uh, and had to get another engine. Now, what year car would that be? What year was the frame, and and uh, what kind of 30, uh, uh, Model A, thirty-two. Uh, 32. Uh, I had initially a Model A frame, and then I switched to a 32. Had a, a flathead uh, uh, engine in it. And it. Didn't have overheads in early days, as far as for Ford. So when you say 1932, was that a 1932 Deuce Coupe that they keep talking about? I had a, go a coupe for just a short while, but it was such bad shape that I uh, more or less uh, I threw the body off of it and put a roadster body on. Now, why do you think so many of the men that we've talked to that grew up at the same time as you did, and he, especially here in Redondo Beach, have all been into cars? Why do you think that that happened? Uh, I, I don't know if that was the same everywhere or it was just the South Bay and Redondo Beach, but all of them have histories of putting these uh, these cars together and racing them, uh, eventually racing them or uh, showing them. Why do you think that's the case? Um I think it's uh, availability. Uh, we had, uh, uh, you could build up a car uh, quite reasonably, uh, dollar-wise, and a lot of old parts were available, and we weren't smart enough to store them all away so we could sell them nowadays. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, they, uh, you, could, you, could, uh, you could buy a Model T for $5, you could buy a Model A for twenty-five, thirty dollars, and uh, that would run, and uh, so uh, you, got, you got your foot in the door, you might say, so that you could you could uh, you could have some wheels. And of course, in those days, there was you didn't need any insurance. All you need is enough money in your pocket to uh, to uh, uh, to put some gas in the darn thing. And uh, and you have and pass the license examination, but insurance was you didn't worry about that. That was uh, no problem at all. You didn't have the the restrictions and overhead that you have today. Now, in two thousand and five, 
gas this uh, in gasoline in 2005 is, uh, we have to look at the month in August, it's around 279, 289. And on the three on three ninety five going to Mammoth, it's three oh nine, three twenty nine, three dollars and twenty nine cents. How much did you pay for gas when you built that first uh, Model A? Fourteen cents a gallon. And uh, so, it was fourteen cents a gallon in what year? Do you think that was? Oh, it'd been in the uh, in the thirties, late thirties, uh, uh, in the forties, uh, uh, be about uh, yeah, be about forties. Uh, early 40s. I, I built one car up when I was home in between trips and uh, uh, in fact that's the one that got stolen. Uh, my mother was driving it. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, I had, had to build up another one uh, but uh, no, I, uh, gasoline you, you, for a, uh, a buck or two you could uh, go just about as far as you wanted to go, and uh, as far as gasoline was concerned, and so it was, it, it was a, a simple time in many ways. We didn't have the, the uh, heavy restrictions we have now as far as anything we want to do, and the cars are so complex that a young kid can't just say, "Oh, I'll pick up an old car and I'll rebuild it and I'll tear it apart and and uh, put it back together and it'll run." Uh, the average kid uh, uh, doesn't have the the expertise or the knowledge to do the uh, the electrical and and the complexities of of the uh, of a car today. It's uh, you you could make a car and it didn't nobody cared whether the lights worked or not as long as it ran and as long as you didn't drive it at night. <laughs> so uh, it, it, things. Things were the time, the things were simple. Things were a lot easier in those days, and we, and also, back then, if you wanted something, you build it. You you just didn't go out didn't didn't go out and buy it or get dad to buy it for you. And if you needed a bicycle, why most of the time you'd find somebody that had an old bike and you'd buy it from them for a buck or two and and put it and rebuild it and you had a bicycle. Um, one of the men that we talked about worked at a gas station at the at the Standard Station, at the corner of Avenue I and Elena, which I guess would be Avenue I and Pacific Coast Highway mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. How many gas stations? You talked about fourteen cents a gallon. How many gas stations do you think Redondo Beach had, and was that a problem? Well, there was a, a Flying A. Uh, Barry would remember uh, Mr. Foster. I think his name was. He used to be there. Uh, and across from where the Elks Club is, right on the point over there, where there's a apartment or something now, and there was a. Um, and that would be at uh, probably Catalina, Catalina and Esplanade, and, and, and where the where Esplanade comes in, uh, and then there was a, um, um, a station that was up the street, uh, just a little ways there, right across from the uh, Masonic Lodge, and uh, and then uh, there was. Uh, there was a station, there were a lot of stations around those because a man could make a living at it. He could, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, back then, I, all in all, why uh, they, now why if, if you run a station, you get a penny a gallon. That's all the, the, the comp companies allow you. Back then, you could, you, could, uh, you could raise a family running a gas station and doing uh, mechanical work. But by the same token, who can do the mechanical work on the darn things now? Um, what do you think the effect was on uh, Redondo Beach when it lost its downtown? That was a darn shame. That that was uh, nobody had the foresight to uh, to preserve and and keep this as a mecca and center for uh, uh, the activities of Redondo Beach. It was just a just a, a gosh awful shame that they didn't keep. A, at least the remnants of it or something instead of putting a bunch of apartments there and whosoever was only looking probably at the tax base and uh, and that's all they cared about and there was no thought to future uh, uh, city and uh, so Redondo is really uh, uh, it's lost an awful lot. And 
What do you see for the future of Redondo Beach? It's, uh, I, 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 I fear the continued uh, expansion of multiple dwellings and more people, more traffic on uh, uh, inadequate streets. And there's no way you can sp expand the streets. There's no way because the, uh, you're you'll be pushing into the dwellings that are there and people don't, won't buy that. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Redondo has probably reached a static condition. It'll be changed as far as uh, a certain amount of commercial uh, uh, changes where you see vacancies, but you'll see more multiple units, uh, uh, and uh, it, it'll, it'll, it is becoming overburdened. You've been all over the world as a merchant seaman, and you probably have traveled uh, on your own at other times. Why is it that you choose to continue to live in the South Bay in Hollywood Riviera and Redondo Beach? Even with its frailties, I would say that climate-wise and uh, uh, when you can uh, turn on the uh, TV and here's Florida getting washed out, here's uh, 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 snow and ice and everything on the East Coast. Up north, they're, they're uh, sh shoveling snow and uh, uh, Arizona is being hit by cloud bursts and or ex extreme heat and and anywhere on this coast you are in a, a, they, you might say a prime area and uh, I'm just so thankful that uh, I spent my life growing and living in this area with its uh, with its uh, advantages it uh, its tops and to move away from here it would, uh, I don't know why I would do it. Uh, I don't have, unless they're off, the police are after me. I'm <laughs> 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 then I'd move. <laughs> All right, well, thank you.